The Skirl of the Vale of Athol Pipers welcomes us to the Burnham Institute, where we are guests to the Dunkeldon Burnham Horticultural Society. Now, the two lovely villages lie roughly 15 miles north of Perth in Scotland, and both communities united 25 years ago to form a mutual and very successful society. Here is the gateway to the Grampian Highlands, marked by a dramatic change from low arable land to the grandeur of mountain and forest. And I'm told that by the banks of the River Tay nearby stands the ancient Burnham Oak, believed to be the sole survivor of the Burnham Wood made famous by the witch's prophecy in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Now, team, the soil on the low ground is a brown alluvial sandy loam, while higher up on the terraces, a sandy ground of glacial origin lies very near the surface. Ladies and gentlemen, your Garda's Question Time team, Dr. Stefan Bolchatsky of Stratford-upon-Avon, Fred Downham of Lancaster, and Sid Robertson of Cumbernauld. <laughs> Thank you very much for your welcome. And we are ready for the first question, please. Brigadier Anstey, for an organic gardener, I'm willing to use chemicals what would you recommend to avoid the attentions of the cabbage root fly and to deal with botrytis in strawberries? In particular, could you recommend a resistant variety available and suitable for use in Scotland? Thank you, Brigadier. An enthusiastic organic gardener, so how can he protect his cabbages from root fly, his strawberries from botrytis without using chemical pesticides? Uh, Stefan. Obviously, we have two totally different problems to contend with here. And the first thing I, I'd like to know is Clay saying to protect your cabbages. Are they, in fact, cabbages, or do you have other sorts of brassicas as well? Yeah, we have other sorts, cabbages and uh, broccoli and uh, savoy. In large quantity? No, uh, 30 plants. Right. Sort of. OK. That, that is useful, because the way that I'm going to suggest that you protect them from cabbage root fly, which is a very effective way, is not something that's really applicable if you have very large numbers of plants because it's too fiddling to do on an enormous scale, but certainly for a couple or three or three dozen, this would work adequately. And no chemicals are needed at all. It is a purely physical method, and it depends on knowing that the female of the cabbage root fly settles on the soil very close to the base of the, of the brassica plant to lay its eggs. Now, if you can deter it from doing that, then there will be no eggs, there will be no larvae, and there will be no damage. And the way to do it is to put a small disc of material, and by a small disc I mean something perhaps four or five inches across, a circular disc of material, uh, into which you cut a slot with a hole in the centre, and this will fit around the base of the stem and sit on the ground. Now, I said material. The ideal substance to use, and people have tried all sorts of things, the ideal substance has proved to be nothing more sophisticated than carpet underlay. The flat form of carpet underlay, cut circular discs of that, uh, slip them around the base of each plant, and off you go. No, no problem at all. As I say, if it's just two or three dozen, it really isn't a, a, a tremendous labour. Now, botrytis and strawberries is a bit of a different matter, because there, inevitably, you're going to get the grey mould spores flying around in the air, and you can't really prevent them from landing on the strawberry plants. There's no barrier you can put to prevent a fungus spore landing. It's too small. And all I can suggest there is that you simply ensure that the conditions among the strawberry plants are least conducive to botrytis growing there. In other words, you want a free circulation of air, you want as little moisture as possible. So don't get the, allow the plants to be too, too crowded. Um, put them in a, in a part of the garden where it is a little more exposed. And um, it's always worth putting straw or some other protection beneath the fruit to keep them out of contact with the soil, because obviously if, if they are in contact with the soil, that'll increase the moisture content. I think there may be varieties that are more successful up here than others, um, but I'd much prefer the, the local voice to tell you that. I think that's something that Sid would have had personal experience of. So, Sid, personal experience? The variety which I think is uh, best now in Scotland is El Santa. El Santa. Uh, it's a fairly large berry and very good flavour, and this is the one that's on. And Gorilla, of course, has been going for a wee bit, and it's quite good too. One that we grew up at Aberdeen was called Idol, I-D-I-L. Uh, a bit smaller, but this is a particularly good one too. So there's three varieties, I think, that would be quite suitable here. Thank you, Sid. So they have a level of resistance anyway here in Scotland, says our local uh, expert. Fred, anything to add? Yeah, I've been very successful with uh, preventing cabbage root fly by growing brassicas through black polythene. It not only keeps the cabbage root fly off, but it stops the weed growing as well. So if you lay a black polythene on the tree prepared ground, plant through it, 
no weeds, no cabbage root fly. All those suggestions, sir, I hope you'll find some useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. Mrs. Jean Dixon, how can I encourage my air plant to grow? It is now three years old and about one and a half inches high. It is on a southeast bathroom windowsill. Thank you, Mrs. Dixon. And your three-year-old air plant is bone idle, you say. It is only one and a half inches tall, although it's three-year-old. Oh, here it is. You've brought it. Oh, the little thing. <laughs> it is in a shell. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Fred. It is in a southeast facing windowsill in the bathroom. Should it be somewhere else, Fred? Yes, I think it should be. In a, in a windowsill in a very damp room. That's the dampest room in the house. Well, it wants to be very damp and very dusty. These, these little plants have become very popular of late. I mean, they're till lanceus. And they live off humidity out of the air and the dust. And that's really all they need. So nothing else. They don't like too much sun. They like dapple shade and a damp atmosphere. And really, that's it. And I, if it's not damp enough, I would spray them with a mist sprayer every, probably every day or every two days. But some of them don't grow very large, and that is not a very large variety. Stefan, this then is not the plant, the air plant, for centrally heated rooms. Well, I don't know, because I have to say that there are a number of these air plant species around at the moment. I haven't a clue what this one is, because I can never tell them apart. And I wonder, although in fact they do live on the moisture... Uh, well, they live on, they obtain their moisture from the air, but they also obtain their nutrient from the air. Nothing's going to, no plant's going to live on water alone. I wonder if, in fact, they wouldn't benefit, although it's not something they come across naturally, from a very dilute misting spray of a liquid houseplant fertiliser. Nothing too strong, because it might scorch the, it might just scorch the foliage, but I can't believe that it would, uh, it would say no to it. I mean, if you lived on dust from the air and someone came along with a nice plate, plate full of fish and chips, I'm sure you'd, you'd <laughs> probably wel welcome it with open arms. I, I do actually quite like them, but I have to say, and I hope you won't take this personally, because I know you didn't actually, you bought this, you didn't create it. I, I much prefer the ones that are growing on a piece of bark or a piece of, of dry wood or a piece of twig in, in much more of the way that they would do naturally. When, I mean, this is, this is more to me of an ornament than anything horticultural because it's growing on this shell. It is a thought. I'm glad you, you brought it along, Mrs. Dixon, because for a lot of people who are possibly living in... Uh, flats with no soil, no garden, little air plants require hardly any attention at all. And they're quite attractive, yeah. and I like them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. Mrs. Malloch, is it possible to grow a camellia outdoors in this area? It is well established, having been in the conservatory, unheated, of course, but has grown too large for the pot. It has been outside all summer and has developed a few black spots on the leaves. Um, We've got samples coming up as well. Thank you, Mrs. Malak. How old is this? Uh, five years. Five years old, and it has been indoors all the time except for this summer. Except has for it? this summer, yes. Yes, right. And it has, Sid, it has got... The leaves have got brown areas on them, about the size, I suppose, of a five-pence piece, the new one. So, A, why should it? And secondly, with your local knowledge, Will camellias grow outdoors in this area? Can I ask, uh, Mrs. Malachy, uh, has it flowered indoors? Yes, you, but the, you, the first flowers were all right, but the second buds dropped. Well, that spells to me dry atmosphere. Uh, outdoors, I mean, camellia plants are quite hardy outdoors, and especially if you grow the Williams eye varieties. Do you know which variety this is? I don't know, but it's a double red. Uh, it could quite well be a Williams Eye variety. And I would say that uh, if you have a very good sheltered area to keep the, the, the cold winds off them and also to keep the early morning sun off them, <laughs> the Williams Eye varieties probably would bloom okay outside. But I think you're doing the right thing by having it in a container and taking it in and flowering it indoors in the spring. Uh, if you'd pass the leaves to Stefan, please, Sid. Stefan, the black spots were dark brown. What do you reckon they are? He's gone very quiet. <laughs> He's examining them carefully. I think this is some, some physiological disorder, and camellia leaves are notorious for this, uh, as are indeed rhododendron leaves. You get lesions in response to all manner of peculiar conditions, and it may simply be the dryness that Sid has referred to is, is one cause of this. But I wonder how you're, what are you feeding this plant on? Just 
uh, tomorite when I feed the tomatoes. I just feed it with tomorite. So a liquid tomato fertiliser. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all right. It'll certainly benefit from that. But if you're only giving it the tomato fertiliser clearly when you're feeding your tomatoes, that means you're not, in fact, starting to feed it until fairly late on into the year. No, well, that's right. No, well, I, I, what I would suggest you do is to start feeding the plant as soon as its flower buds begin mm. to be apparent, which is very much earlier. I would, in fact, stop feeding it um, about a month or two after the flowers have faded, which, in a sense, is precisely the time at the moment I guess you're starting to feed it. Uh, so you're, you're feeding, I think, at the wrong time of the year. I would mm. feed it maybe during the period that I've suggested, about once a fortnight. Tomato fertiliser is fine, but any of the liquid plant feeds that are high in, high in potash would be suitable. But I think the, the clue to the problem of, of the buds dropping and I think to some extent of those black lesions as well is the fact that the atmosphere is just too dry for it. It needs to be in a more, more moist situation. So in actual fact, it will be better outside? Yes. Out of its pot, and planted in your we garden? We just stay out all winter because I've planted it in the garden in a sheltered spot and I was going to protect it yes. during the winter. But you took it out of its pot first? Yes, oh Good. Yes, yes. yes. It is hardy. But if in doubt, when you get your very hard frost, why not throw a fine mesh nylon net over it, just overnight? Mm. It'll be perfectly all right. Mm. I can't see you heaving this thing in and out. <laughs> You're not big enough. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Do we have another question? Tom Dick. At the back of our house is a steep grassy bank which I've been planting as a shrubbery. Being now retired, I find the grass cutting an increasingly irksome chore. Were I to spray out the grass, would the residual thatch be sufficient to prevent soil erosion? Or should I leave well alone in the hope that the maturing shrubs will in time take over to the extent that the grass will quietly capitulate? Thank you, Tom Dick. Tempted to ask what happened to Harry. But <laughs> any, anyway, steep grass banks team, as we know, they're a problem. And planting them with shrubs will eventually reduce the workload. But how best to control grass and weeds until the shrubs are established? That is the problem, Fred. Yeah, it, it is a problem. Can, can I ask you, what uh, sort of work did you do before you retired? <laughs> <laughs> I was the parish minister and I had, oh. <laughs> I had an even bigger garden to look after. Did you? Because yeah, if I remember rightly, when I went to Sunday school, there was a story told about the saw went to sow seeds, wasn't there? You know it better than me. Um, some fell there by the wayside, some fell on stony ground, if I remember. Some fell on good ground. But at least missed out steep slopes. Yes. <laughs> that's probably why you've come to us, is it? <laughs> it is. Um, it is. It's very, very difficult. And if you move that grass, I think that slope will slip. You'll get uh, soil coming down there, especially when it rains, because this can be a very damp area. And as well as the soil is sandy, it's loose. So I would lose, leave the grass well alone, leave it where it is. And I would start planting plants in there which stolen it. I'm thinking of Cotoniaster dameri, Stogholm. The ones that trail and then root and then trail and then root again. And there is a little salix, a little willow called Retusa. And if you plant that on there, it'll cover that banking in no time. It spreads out, moves probably two foot in every year, all, all directions, and it'll meet up you won't need to bother with grass and the other shrubs will come through it. It'll solve your problem. I, I can certainly back up the uh, Cotonia astodamari. It is a smashing spreader and its natural habit is to go downwards rather than up. And it does root itself as it goes along. The best of luck, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next, please. Angie Stewart. We were given a beautiful gardenia plant a year ago. The leaves are lovely and glossy, but every now and then one drops off and the flowers never last, they come out so far, and then they come off. So what have we done wrong? Thank you, Mr. Stewart, and you've brought the plant along. And uh, I'm gonna pass it down to Stefan. Strikes me, Stefan, that the compost in the pot looks a bit on the dry side. The leaves are a bit yellowish looking. Your diagnosis, please. Well, I'd certainly diagnose the compost as being on the dry side. Yes, it is. And I think I have to say, that I, much as I adore gardenias, I think they're beautiful, and a well-grown gardenia is a, is a glory to behold, they are not easy. They are among the most difficult of houseplants in terms of the conditions they require. They must have an acid compost, which I assume this one has. It looks like a, a, a compost well-founded on peat. So they must have an acid compost. They must have constant moisture, which this basically hasn't got at the moment because it's 
the, the compost has gone dry. Yeah. Um, they must have a uniform temperature. They will not tolerate big fluctuations in temperature. And that is something that's very hard to satisfy in a house because whilst you may, say, you keep the central heating on and you put it in a warm place and all the rest of it, you come down to your living room at 3 o'clock in the morning and with the best will in the world, it's going to be pretty chilly. And that's the time that gardenias suffer because you get a drop in temperature at night. They really need a temperature of about 60 degrees, which I'm sure you can provide in the daytime. But I doubt you're going to provide that right through the night. And that is the problem with them. So I'm not saying they're impossible as house plants. I'm just saying they're difficult. And you really need to choose a position in the house where, in a room where the temperature at night is, is least likely to drop. Um, but in saying all that, this plant is also suffering from the fact that it's, it's got a nutrient deficiency. And these, these leaves, which should be lovely and rich and green and glossy, in fact, the, the leaves towards the top of the plant, which are the ones that are the furthest... <laughs> it doesn't take a genius to work this out. They're the ones that are furthest, <laughs> furthest from the root system. <laughs> well done. Uh, and therefore tend to be the ones that, that suffer first because nutrient and moisture is not reaching up to them. They are showing classic symptoms of iron deficiency in that the leaves have gone pale and the veins have remained dark green. So what this plant needs is general liquid fertiliser. I think I would be inclined to give it a dose of liquid sequestrine, which is a form of iron to, to counteract this deficiency that it already has. Um, keep this compost moist and then just think carefully about the positioning in your house and find somewhere where it can be kept in as, as constant a temperature and as close to about 60 as, as is reasonably yes. feasible. You'd feed it now, Stefan, um, early October? Yes, I would, because if the thing is going to be kept in its optimum temperature, it really ought to be continuing in, con in admittedly slow growth, but some growth right through the winter. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. And, and certainly there is an obvious deficiency now which I think needs correcting. That's what yellow leaves mean. It means a deficiency. Yeah, in general, yellow leaves mean a deficiency. And yellow leaves, when the veins are dark green, is a very characteristic deficiency of mm -hmm. iron. And can you keep that temperature in winter at night, 60 degrees? Wow. Ish? Take it to bed with you? <laughs> or something. The warmest place away from windows. Yes. Middle of the room. Yes then I think you'll be all right under the feeding as digested. Right. Thank, Thank you, you, madam. Thank, Thank you. you. Lovely plant to gardenia. Uh, and we can take another question, please. David Croshaw. I moved into a cottage in Burnham last autumn, and in the front garden is a large shrub, 12 foot high, about 7 foot wide, which I recently identified as Holodiscus discola. How and when do I prune, please? Thank you, Mr. Croshaw, and you very kindly brought a marvellous picture of it, and it looks absolutely beautiful. It is Sid Holodiscus discolor. Uh, when did it bloom? May, June. May, June, May this June. year, yeah, right. So, uh, tell us a bit about it, Sid. Well, this is a very hardy shrub. I don't know if it's all that common, you know. I mean, uh, there's not acres of it in Burnham, you know, but, but it's a wonderful shrub. It comes from North America, I think. And broadly speaking, you don't have to do any pruning apart from shortening it if it's getting out of, of hand for the space. You can do a bit of rejuvenation pruning, in other words, reaching down into the centre of the plant and cutting out the older, heavier wood and taking it out right at the bottom because it has lovely, graceful habit. And your picture really shows that. You've seen the uh, photograph, Fred. Uh, have you grown it? If not, why not? Because it looks most attractive. Yeah, we, we used to sell these plants and we used to sell it as spirea discolor. And it's a beautiful thing with these creamy, feathery, almost white plumes. Just like in a steel bee almost, but yeah. almost hanging down. A beautiful thing. No, it says, right, you don't need to prune it. But I think it does it good to cut some of it out every now and again. After it's flowered, and then it will renew itself. Feed it, mulch it every now and again. It'll make a lovely show and last for years and years and years. And it is, of course, Fred, perfectly hardy, isn't it? It is. May I say again, it is holo discus, H-O-L-O-D-I-S-C-U-S, discolor. And it is a magnificent shrub. Thank you, sir, for bringing the picture. Thank you. Next, please. John Mattingly. Uh, I would like to grow Sequoia dendra giganteum from seed. When do I collect the seed and how do I treat it once I've got it? Thank you. It's a giant redwood, Sequoia dendron giganteum, which will grow, of course, Sid, up to 100 feet, will it not? It will indeed, and it's about 30 years old or so before you get the cones. Uh, uh, but you have the cones, is that right, John? Mm, yes, plenty of cones. Uh, well, I mean, I would gather them in the autumn, and I would dry them off, and I would break them up in the spring, individually, you know, I mean, to, make the, to get to the seeds. And I would sow them in a cold frame, I think, a shaded cold frame. And uh, they will be in there, and they will grow over the summertime, 
but I would leave them there as long as maybe a couple of years before I lifted them. They do take quite a long time to grow. Yes. Uh, Fred? I think I would saw them straight away as soon as you take them out of the corns. They seem to develop better when they're fresh. And I'd use a soil-based, very gritty compost, put them in there, put them outside, cover them to stop mice or anything taking the seeds and expose them to the cold. And I reckon next spring, when it comes to warm up, they'll grow. Well, that seems easy enough. Stefan, do you agree? Yes, I'd agree with what uh, Fred has said. In effect, you're, you're stratifying the seed, which is putting them in either, a, either sand or a very gritty compost and leaving them out over winter. And it's worth bearing in mind the cones, in fact, develop in one year and they remain green and fairly tight in that first year. And in the second year, they then darken and become brown or reddish brown. Yes. And, and uh, those are the ones that you have, mm -hmm. the cones at the end of the second year. Thank you. Your problem, sir. Your name as well, please. Jim Ward. For the benefit of angina sufferers, can the team advise on vegetable gardening without digging? Would crop rotation still be necessary? And are there any vegetables such as potatoes that should not be planted? I have greatly reduced weeding by covering unused parts of the vegetable plot with black polythene. I have also grown sprouts and cabbage through slits in black polythene. Is the use of black polythene over large areas in this way damaging to the soil? Thank you, sir. Interesting question. Uh, angina sufferers, and also, of course, the elderly and the, and the idle, they'd like to grow veg without digging. Also, Mr. Ward wants to know, Fred, if covering the soil with black polythene over a long period is harmful to the soil, that is. Advice, please. Well, I wouldn't leave it on too long. I think I'd take it off after you've cropped it in that year and then start again with some new black polythene because it's not easy to put down a second time. But you also mentioned growing potatoes. And I suppose that the difficulty with growing potatoes is lifting them at the end of the season. I would grow potatoes under black polythene. And all you need to do is leave the ground, put a good mulch on there, put the black polythene down on top, put some slits in the black polythene, push the potatoes through, put the polythene back and just leave them. The tops will then start to grow, and they may need a little bit of help to get them through the holes in the black polythene. But once they've done that, they will grow. And all you need to do when the crop is ready is just lift up the edges of the black polythene, and the potatoes will be there on the top. The biggest advantage of this is when you pick, pick your new potatoes, you pick the big ones, put the polythene back, and wait for the smaller ones to grow. Hmm. <laughs> so obviously, black polythene has many advantages. Uh, and Mr. Ward, Fred, would also like to know whether crop rotation would be a good idea still? Oh, yes, I think it is. If you could make three raised narrow beds and grow on those and rotate them like you do in any else, other part of the garden, it would improve your crops, definitely, because some crops will take more out of the ground than others. So you won't need as much moss on some parts as you will on the other parts of the garden. Does that solve it for you, it sir? It certainly does, yes. Good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And we have time for just one more question. Janet Yule, is there any way of propagating aquilegias apart from seed? Propagating an aquilegia, a columbine, granny's yeah. bonnets, call it what you will, other than by other than seed. seed. Why, what have you got against seed? Well, the models of the aquilegia, in fact. The models of the aquilegia? <laughs> well, they, they, they hybridise so easily. Oh, yes, but they... We had this, this summer a seedling which came up and one parent is obviously Nora Barlow, because there's a very pretty rough round the back of the, of the flower, yes. but the cup is a perfect cup, pink, ah, and very pretty. You have a lovely plant there. We have, but we'd like one or two more of them if yes. possible, but I don't trust the seeds. No, you're quite right. You, you would probably, you'd get some of uh, might. the new hybrid, probably, mm. but maybe only one or two. Stefan, how else can you propagate aquilegia? Well, the obvious way, of course, is to wait until you've got a large enough clump of plants and then do it by division. Oh, I but what, I, what I'd be tempted to do is, is, is this the first year you've had this plant? Yes. So it's still going to be a fairly small thing? Well, it, it grew fairly well. It enjoyed itself. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it would in such a delightful, <laughs> delightful spot. I'm sure it enjoyed itself. What I would be tempted to do, therefore, is 
uh, early in the spring, when the first mm. young shoots are arising, yeah. is to try taking some of those young shoots and try rooting those. If I you can see. possibly get as what, cuttings, as cuttings, indeed, mm. yes. Um, if you can possibly get off the plant what what is properly called an Irishman's, I mean, Scotland's the right place mm. to die, Irishman's cuttings, isn't it? Um, <laughs> which is a cutting with a tiny little bit of root attached to it, so much the better, but that may not be possible. But I think you, you could well get the young shoots to strike if you keep the conditions very moist. Uh, it'd be worth trying. Obviously, don't take them all off, if, because you may, use them, you may lose yes. them. But I think that would, that would certainly be worth trying. Right. Thank you. Fred, so it's either division of, well, the plant will have to be fairly well established, or cuttings of new growth. Yeah, I mean, I would keep the seed as well. I would sow every seed you get. I think we've lost them this year. There oh. were too many other things round about. Well, you never know. If any seedlings pop up round there, we'll keep mm. every one. Maybe grow them in pots and then you know which ones are which. And if they do come true to type, keep all those. Mm. And put all those to one side of the garden on their own. So they may not get interested mm. in other aquilegias. But <laughs> the idea of, of taking what we call Irishman's cuttings, the best way to do that is actually to mulch that plant when it starts to grow in the spring. Wait until the growth gets to about three or four inches high, get a good light compost, maybe a mixture of Johnny's number two and some peat and some sand added to it to make it nice and light and put about an inch layer on top of the old plant in amongst the leaves and everywhere. Leave it for about two months and then part it and you'll find that some of those young growths will have roots on the end and pot them up separate. Fine. Thank mm. you very much. And we'll go halves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Team, as we approach the end of the programme, I ask you please for your topical tips, starting with you, Stefan. I just wanted to say a word about toadstools and mushrooms that you'll see growing in your gardens, particularly growing on your lawns at this time of the year. First thing to say is don't worry about them. They're most unlikely to do your lawn any harm. If you have them in a fairy ring formation, then it might be worth giving a little extra feed to the grass in that area, which might suffer slightly. But the others, the little brown ones or white ones that grow all over your lawn, don't worry about them. If they offend your eye, chop them off, but I'd rather you left them. But just one additional word of caution, if you're tempted to try eating wild mushrooms, some of which are excellent, some of which are very poisonous, only do so if you've been told by an expert that the ones you have are edible. Good advice. Thank you, Stefan. Sid. Uh, winter is just around the corner, hard winter, so I'm thinking about lagging all the upright standpipes. You can use straw or bracken, and do take some inside because this might help to protect any potatoes you have in sacks in the garage. A stitch in time. Thank you, Sid. And finally, Fred. If you want to get an early start with your sweet peas, sow them in the next couple of weeks. Down south, they can go in straight outside. In the colder parts of the country, they need a shelter of a frame or even a greenhouse. If you want two good varieties, the Queen Mother is salmon and Diamond Wedding is a beautiful white. Thank you for the advice, Fred. And that's it. We've been the guests of the Dunkeld and Burnham Horticultural Society in Perthshire. Do join us again next week when we shall be the guests of the Minehead and District Gardeners Association. Till then, it's goodbye and good gardening from Dr. Stefan Buczewski, Fred Downham, Sid Robertson, our producer Diana Stenson, and from me, Clay Jones. A very good day to you. <laughs> <laughs>